Our speaker tonight, how many of you already know this lady? Annalise Neffos, born in Switzerland, studied, graduated business administration. She has two brothers and her father a physician of internal medicine. And this lovely woman worked as Winston Churchill's chief of staff, which is something I can hardly wrap my mind around. And even though Churchill has been gone almost 50 years, it's interesting that books are still coming out about him. The latest one I've noticed, and it seems particularly appropriate tonight, Dinner with Churchill, which tells all sorts of things, and who knows what Annalise is going to share with us tonight about Dinner with Churchill. She worked for Interpol. Her husband brought her to this country in 1970, and she graduated from the University of Akron with a double major in humanities and European literature. And then she graduated from the Gemological Institute of America in Santa Monica, and she's a certified diamondologist and appraiser. Also a graduate of the Diamond Council of America with a degree guild gemologist. And then in 1987, she started her store here in Medina, which has just celebrated its 25th anniversary. And I'm sure you've seen the articles in the paper about it. And she showed me her very lovely proclamations from the uh, Ohio Senate and the Ohio House uh, congratulating her on her time here as a Medina businesswoman. So Annalise, please tell us about Winston Churchill. I'm so honored to be here tonight. Uh, I did not know there was still such interest, and I'm very, very touched. So uh, when Elizabeth asked me about uh, what memories that I have from the Second World War, I said, oh, I don't know. I was barely nine years old when the war ended, so I dug deep into my memory bank, and I was surprised how many things I did remember. Can I share them with you? Are you interested? Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the, my first memory was that it looked like war was when my father was in uniform and held my twin brother and I in his arms. And my mom was standing there, dipping her face, I think, tears because he said goodbye, but I was too young to understand that he's going to war. Uh, you all know Switzerland was neutral, but we had to protect our borders. And so my father served uh, between Italy and Switzerland in the Alps, and then had to come down because a lot of his soldiers became snow blind, so they had to come down to the valley. And so uh, our doctor one day came to the house to attend to one of our family members. And like we did with everybody, we would escort, escort them to the car. And so the doctor started the car as he wanted to drive away. And I saw barely a light on that car. So I asked my auntie, why is that car light so dim? And she said, there is war all around us, and we have to dim our windows with black shades and even the car. So I was thinking, how on God's earth did he ever found his way around? Because they had some navy uh, cloth in front of his lights. So uh, one morning, one cold, cold winter night, as I went to bed, suddenly I woke up with a large clatter of metal falling onto the ground. And then I remember, oh, our snow shuffle, it was winter, our snow shuffles were leaning against the columns in the back. And my window was in the back of the house. And I said, that sounds awfully strange. So I called my auntie 
Auntie Agnes, come and see what's going on. Well, without coming to see what was going on, she grabbed the rifle. Now, we had rifles in every room. Uh, and I tell you why. My father was a sharpshooter. My mother was a sharpshooter. I am a sharpshooter. My twin brother, the whole family is. So, but I think in those days they did that more for, because the men were in war and only the women were home. And we lived on a big farm away from the uh, hustle bustle of traffic, so I think it was also a safety thing. So she grabbed the rifle, came to my bedroom and opened the window and then we have wooden shutters that you can open or close. And she just gently raised them, put the rifle in it, and there we saw them. Three wolves standing around. They were hungry for wolves to come that close. They must be very hungry. And again, since we all are sharpshooters, with one shot, she killed one. And the rest took off. So that was quite an introduction to cold, cold weather and winters we had in those days. And so uh, the first memory of, I can remember, of crying was again in the winter time where all the horses were in military service. Our horses, our neighbors' horses, they were all in military service. So when the snow fell, there was scarcely someone who could plow the street. So as a uh, toddler, as a young first classer, we had to walk to school and the snow would come up to our waist. And so pulling our leg up and putting it down, suddenly I just sat into the snow and cried. And that is the first time that I remember. Of course, I cried many times before, but I didn't remember it. So, and um, my father, when he came back from the assignment of the border between Italy, Italy and Switzerland, he had a new assignment on the Rhine River, which is north of Switzerland. Half of the Rhine River belongs to Switzerland, the other half to Germany. And he had 150 men that were sharpshooters like he, and he lined them up. I don't know the distance between each man. And the reason for that was because people tried to swim across the Rhine River to safety into Switzerland. And of course, the German shot at them while they were swimming. Uh, across. So uh, I remember my father saying, uh, if hard training and defending life, any life, being a foreigner, being a foe or a friend, his biggest pleasure was of shooting at the Germans when they were shooting at the people who sw tried to swim across. And as a sharpshooter, you kill with the first shot, or you are not a sharpshooter. So the minute uh, a, a small flare came from across the river, two seconds later, that man was dead. So um, I remember that, and I said, wow. As a young child, you have difficulty to grasp the, the importance of some of the things that your parents are saying. Thank God we have a memory and we can recall it. And then we start to realize, oh, that's what it really meant. So then all the newspapers and magazines in our house became invisible. The radio were, was in its lowest volume. Um, one day, one of our field hands came up to the house and I said, why is this man walking? Oh, all our horses are in military service again. Everything uh, went for the defense of Switzerland. And then came, thank God, came you Americans. 
started to help us rescue Europe. And that I remember very vividly because uh, your heavy, large planes were laden with uh, bombs and they sounded differently because they were so heavy laden with, uh, when they flew over and of course Switzerland was blacked out, was totally blacked out. The only thing the pilots, your pilots had to guide where is Switzerland starting is the Rhine River. If it was a clear enough night, the, the reflection of the water but accidentally a few bombs did fall on the Swiss uh, side. But that is also part of war. But um, the tremors uh, that I remember, and even the sirens, and as a child you don't know what the sirens mean, except when the sirens were on, we all had to go in a shelter. Every house, every apartment building in Switzerland had to have a shelter where you can go and stay for 24 hours or 36 hours with blankets, food, water, and of course uh, we had that too, and the best part was it also was a lot of chocolate, so we children didn't mind to go to the shelter because we just started to stuff our faces with chocolate. <laughs> so then one uh, day uh, in summer, we were they, uh, uh, my two brothers and I, we were trained very early in shooting. So uh, they uh, put us against the house wall, the cement wall, with a tripod. We were practicing, target practicing, and suddenly we saw a plane coming very, very low, and it landed on our land. And we children ran uh, to the plane, and the pilot came out. Uh, you could see the fright on his face because he did not know where he landed. And we children said, Swiss, Switzerland. and. Finally, I think he understood, and he bent down, knelt down, and kissed the ground. And we children took both of his hands, and we ran to the house. And uh, we gave, gave him food and shelter, and he stayed with us for a long time, because Switzerland at that time was actually a big internment camp. Uh, every house who had something to spare took someone in. And so, but one day after the war, I forget when that was, a beautiful car drove up on our driveway and a car we had never seen before. Here, that pilot, he was from Czechoslovakia. He was an engineer, a mechanical or whatever engineer. He built that car. It was a burgundy red, beautiful car, and he drove to Switzerland to come and see us, to show it to us, and we have become friends, of course, and stayed friends all our lives through. That was such a wonderful experience. So, and then when we finally, by accident, we saw a newspaper. As I said, newspaper and magazine just became invisible. Our family did not want us to see the horrors, the, uh, the, the pictures. But we accidentally saw one newspaper, and on the front page were four or five people hanging upside down. And uh, later on, I realized that was Mussolini and his girlfriend and whoever else. Um, then flyers were dropped from airplanes. Some, of course, were uh, German propaganda. Uh, most of them actually were. And uh, parachuters coming from everywhere. And of course, by then we were pretty much used to, to just make room wherever we could find room for them and food for them. And to, till about a few years ago, in Switzerland, every family had to have, what do we call this, a ration uh, package. Uh, in other words, rice, sugar, 
beans, canned food, so much each family had to store. And there were inspections every three to six months. The government would come by and actually check if you had the, all these reserves. And that goes all back to the war, where, of course, everything was rationed and everybody had to fend for themselves. So these dear people are what I could come up with memories from the wartime um, in, in my country. So now, if you like, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about how I got the job in Winston Churchill. Are you interested to hear it? Yes? Oh, okay. Um, it actually goes right back to the Second World War. Um, after you Americans came to liberate us in Europe, and of course the Marshall Plan came in existence to rebuild war ravaged Europe, then the English language became the international language before it was French. If you had to travel anywhere, you needed to know French. Then from the Second World War on, it became English. Uh, I happened to grow up with three languages, uh, two, uh, German and French, and a third one that is only a spoken one, not a written one. But then I went to Italy and learned Italian, and I learned Greek, and then I realized I am a young woman getting to the uh, uh, job market, and now English is really in. So my girlfriend and I said we would like to go to the United States and learn English here. But at the time, there was still a visa you need, a, a visa quota were in, uh, in, enforced. And so after a year, we were tired of waiting for a, a visa. To, to get. So we found a job in England in the southern uh, seashore. It was a holiday where people go in vacation and no vacations. We worked seven days a week. We had two, three hours off a day, but no vacations other than that. So in the fall, when the season was over, we had lots of money and we said, okay, let's go to London and we really liked it and we started traveling seeing the countryside and finally their money ran out so we wrote home please send us some money from the savings that we had saved before we left and the answer came oh no no you are coming back home but we are we were not ready to come home <laughs> so we took was called au pair jobs, like in the olden days you would go to the center of a village or a town and you work for one day, carpenter, uh, electrician, bricklayers, just, it's just a job for a day. So we did that quite often till the money ran out and then finally we went to a agency who had permanent employment and we wanted to go a job together. That wasn't so easy. But we said, in the meantime, we just do those au pair jobs. And one day we were called and um, she, the lady mumbled something about Churchill, but there is Churchill clubs, Churchill this, Churchill that. We never thought it was D. Sir Winston Churchill. Till she said, uh, she gave us pages of what we have to find what we, information we have to get from Switzerland. To make a long story short, it was a two and a half, almost three months time elapsed till we got all the information they needed from us. And to this day, I believe Scotland Yard and Interpol and the FBI still knows more about our family than we will ever know. <laughs> So uh, then finally she said, yes, it is this, it's Sir Winston. He is in the uh, Mediterranean cruising with uh, Onassis, the, Mr. Onassis, who then married 
Jacqueline Kennedy. And, uh, but his uh, main secretary wanted an interview with us. So we went to Hyde Park Gate 28. That was the London residence. And uh, we took a taxi and we gave the taxi the address. And he looked at us too and he shook his head. He said, no, we have to go there. <laughs> what do those two kids want with Winston Churchill's address? Uh, so would you believe uh, we knocked on the door, a big heavy brass ring, a gentleman came out and the taxi driver actually waited till we entered that door and the door was closed. He just couldn't believe this. So uh, we were uh, escorted into a beautiful uh, office, sat down and he sat in front of us and the strange part was he sort of looked us over like, ah, the, this is the goods. In other words, he had all the dossiers in front of him. He knew everything about us. He was just looking us over, really not asking any questions. And suddenly he said, would you like to see a little bit something of this mansion? We nodded, yes. So he took us through the first floor. And we thought, well, hmm, maybe we are in the sort of last uh, few runnings for candidates. And so we, he escorted us to the door and said he will let us know. And we lived at, a, what is it called? A use uh, hostel, hostel. I never can say it, hospice, hostel, hostel, yes. For girls, that's right, thank you. And so one evening we were at dinner and the phone rang, uh, uh, the lady from the uh, office said, there is a phone that I need to answer. And so I uh, answered the phone and it was the same gentleman who said, you ought to report six o'clock Saturday afternoon at Westerham at the Churchill's uh, uh, country estate. Okay. We had no idea what that was. So, uh, we, of course, needless to say, that evening nobody watched television. We all just chatted and thought how exciting that is that we actually got the job. And uh, we went to the directress and asked her if she would help us getting there. She said, oh, there is no problem. Two uh, houses down from where we were was the police station. So on Saturday, the police came, took our luggage, uh, walked us to the bus, put the luggage on the bus, and told the bus driver where to let us out. So we came out of the bus, and there stood a Rolls Royce with a chauffeur standing next to it, and we thought high dignitaries are coming here to town too, not just us little girls. And uh, as we were standing there waiting, the chauffeur from the Rolls Royce walked over to us and asked us if I am Annalise Subair and if the, my girlfriend is Frida Miley, and we nodded. So he took our luggage, posted it in the car, opened the door, and started driving. The most beautiful countryside, it's in Kent. I don't know if anyone has ever been in Kent. Uh, it's a uh, countryside, very, very beautiful, uh, hills and dales, and suddenly uh, you saw a, um, a dark red uh, wall with iron fence on top of it, and in the distance a brick building, and that was Sir Winston's estate, and he drove up what we saw was a side entrance, and Scotland Yard came and took our luggage and uh, escorted us into our rooms. 15 minutes later, the secretary of Lady Churchill came and told me, I have to serve dinner tonight. Yeah. Uh, no idea 
alcohol. Uh, my, uh, the only rescue was I, my parents uh, had sent me to a very, very fine finishing school in Switzerland. I, one of those days, I would like to write a little booklet because all the wealthy, most spoiled girls are sent there. Uh, and it's, it's hilarious. Uh, what uh, what goes on in those? I, at least I was not spoiled enough that someone had to dress me, that someone had to comb my hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But a lot of the girls said they they never did anything. So um, I I called uh, Scotland Yard and said if he would show me how to get to the main building. And he said, gladly. And he actually knew where my office would be, which is right next to the huge dining room. And so I looked around the room, and suddenly I heard in the corridor a sound like chintz fabric, a fabric that makes a lot of noise. And uh, suddenly I saw Lady Churchill standing in the door frame. Of course, we had never met. I only knew her from photos. And she greeted me. Uh, she gave me several keys and uh, said, I show you. They had a walk-in vault in my office where all the fine china, crystal, sterling is. <coughs> and said, the dinner will be served at 8.15 and left. I had no idea what is going to be served. Oh, she said they were only two tonight, no guests. So uh, I looked for a tablecloth. I walked into the dining room, a huge table. Where is no table, tablecloth? OK. So I opened the vault, and I saw placemats, sterling inlaid with gold, inlaid with semi-precious stones. So I just took two and, uh, wait a minute, before I go any further, for fork, knives, glasses, I need to know what is going to be served. So where is the kitchen, where is the cook? Uh, as I was looking, I saw a dumb waiter, you know where you go up or down? And I put a piece of paper in there saying, my name is Annalise. Uh, please tell me what is the menu that we are serving tonight. And I put it up, nothing happened. Pulled it down, I said, maybe there is a downstairs. <laughs> so I put it downstairs, and after a few minutes it came up, and there was the whole menu for dinner. So at least now I knew what sterling flatware, uh, what wine, white wine, red wine, uh, I knew champagne will be served afterwards, and the very last will be brandy. So, uh, how do I say this? As I was finishing up, getting ready about 10 minutes before um, 8.15, I heard, it was a long corridor that turns. So you're coming around the corner to a long corridor, and the very end is the dining room. And I heard all kinds of footsteps, although the, it was carpeted, like several people were walking. Several people were walking. Two men holding bird cages with birds in it. And then came Lady Churchill. And after Lady Churchill came Winston Churchill. Now, I have never met Winston Churchill before. So I am standing just away from the frame of the, the entrance to the dining room. And to my amazement, Winston Churchill stood still, looked me over like I was made out of glass, and then reached for my hand. Now, in England, men do not reach for the women's hand. Only men greet each other by the hand. Women just greet each other verbally, but never reach. I thought that was so... Um, discriminating against women. To this day, I think that, because uh, it is so obvious of a distinction. And humans are humans. What does it matter that it's male or female? We are all humans. So, but 
that he actually reached for my hand and welcomed me and said, welcome, we have been looking forward to having you. So the dinner went fairly well and Winston Churchill left early. No, Lady Churchill left early. And so he called me, I heard a ring, and he called me and he said, please would you take this glass and would you take this plate? And so he would call me several times just so that he could see me. And, that, and then, of course, I have to tell you, I was only allowed to speak French to Winston Churchill and High German to Lady Churchill. Uh, I had 18 people helping me run those two households. So this is now the weekend in, in, in the countryside. Uh, on Monday morning, Bentleys and Rolls Royce and staff were traveling to London and then the whole thing started all over again. So I, what I'm telling you, it's just scratching the surface because everybody with rank, name, money and power came in and out of those residences. Uh, I had meetings in the morning with Lady Churchill, who is coming for lunch, who is coming for tea, who is coming for dinner, who is staying overnight. Um, and then meeting with the gardener, uh, then the wines. I had a very good memory in those days, but now it's a different story. Uh, he, uh, after the war, I think France and the United States competed with each other in trying to outdo a gift to Winston Churchill and uh, President Roosevelt because those two men, uh, uh, I think Ro uh, President Roosevelt said, knowing Winston is like a champagne. Uh, meeting Winston is like a champagne bottle. Knowing him is like drinking it. So those two men, was the, that was one of the big gifts that those two men understood each other and worked with each other because if you people and your nation would not have come to Europe, let, believe me, I would not stand here in front of you and talk to you about it. We would all have disappeared. So again, I am forever grateful and I am a very proud American this is my new country and I love it. I'm very proud of it. So um, anyway, um, Winston <laughs> uh, one day went to uh, Washington DC and that, this has been told uh, by his secretary uh, and met with uh, President Roosevelt in the White House. And President Roosevelt went to say good night to Winston Churchill and knocked on the door. Normally the valet would open the door, but Sir Winston must have been close by the door and he opened the door. And there stood President Roosevelt, except Winston Churchill was split in naked. <laughs> and of course, uh, President Roosevelt took it aback. And uh, Sir Winston said, oh no, 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 no. The Prime Minister has absolutely nothing to hide in front of the President of the United States. <laughs> uh, I had a very similar encounter one uh, uh, night when uh, at, in the morning I was always the first and at night the last. That's why I became a night owl. I never go to bed before one or two in the morning, even today. He was a night owl. He never went up before 11 o'clock in the morning. He had breakfast in bed and meat with mashed potatoes washed down by a glass of wine. He said, carnivores will rule this earth. I don't trust people who don't like meat. <laughs> so <clears throat> then his valet would make his ba bath ready, uh, of course, help him dress and comb and put cologne on and uh, one morning I came up 
uh, go to work I had. I could take the employee staircase during the day, I could take the formal uh, staircase, but I would come up from the employee staircase and there were two doors, swing doors, which had a beautiful milky white decoration. And on the end is that big corridor. And I saw a, 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 a person walking on that long corridor at seven o'clock in the morning, other than a night nurse or a night valet helping Winston Churchill because he called for something. But, and on the end are two big windows. So the glare from the windows just gave me a dark silhouette. So I had no idea who was actually walking in the corridor. Suddenly, I hear the voice in French, Annalise, is it you? And that's Sir Winston's voice. And I said, yes, it's me, Sir Winston. So I keep on walking, thinking he needed something. And about three or four feet before I reached him, there he was walking towards his room, splitting and naked. <laughs> and I was, I was just stunned. And he had a smile on his face and then turned around, excuse me, and then he said, you are just looking at the most beautiful ass you have ever seen. <laughs> and kept on walking. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that was a very heated morning because <laughs> Uh, someone got in a lot of trouble uh, because uh, he's one of his valet uh, night nurse. Um, he liked uh, a little bit too much of drink and he got a little bit too much and didn't hear the ring. So Sir Winston went to go and look for it. And then one morning, okay, I had a roster of all the license plate of the royal family and all the wealthy dukes, counts, baronesses, etc. that would come uninvited just because they passed by. And so I would have the number of their license plate and I had to confirm that license plate before Scotland Yard could open up any gate. So one morning there was a dark green Maserati, and I am a car freak, so I know cars just by sight. So dark green Maserati, you say, who is this? I am looking at the roster of all the license plate. That number is not on there. Now, Scotland Yard is calling. Can I open? Can we open? I said, no. No, there is nobody here with this license plate. Now, finally, I'm getting the binoculars. Prince Philip, Queen Elizabeth II's husband. I said, open the gates. <laughs> so he is coming. And uh, I come downstairs and make my royal bow and said he would like to say good morning to Sir Winston because he knew he's not going to be out of bed before 11 o'clock. And so I, had, I ran in front of him thinking that I will get ahead of him before he is entering Sir Winston's bedroom. So very, very slightly, I, I was sliding by him and uh, they greeted each other. And uh, Prince Philip said, I come here to take you out for a spin. I just bought my new Maserati. Uh, and uh, Sir Winston looked at me and he said, that uh, takes, that needs a little something to celebrate. And he looked at me and I knew what he meant. Go and get a bottle of champagne. And so I went and got a bottle of champagne. In the meantime, one of the employees had to make the fire uh, ready. Uh, uh, spruce it up and I'm coming now in the room with a bottle of champagne and two glasses and as I am going from one is it okay 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 uh, 
Excuse me. Uh, as I'm trying to uh, go around the bed in front of the fireplace, my, with my foot, I stopped on against a carpet in front of the fireplace, and the whole bottle with the glasses fell in front of Prince, His Royal Highness Prince Philip. I wanted to disappear into the ground, and Sir Winston uh, started laughing. He said, I think you and I have had much worse thrown in front of our feet than a bottle of champagne. He was so nice. He uh, was so human. Uh, he would never on purpose uh, embarrass you or put you on the defense. Uh, but one thing he could not tolerate uh, was a yes and amen person. He would say, uh, if you were employed by him or worked with him politically or any which way, he would say to you, how can you and I work harmonious with each other if I don't know what you're thinking? Don't just not, don't just say yes, don't just say whatever. I want to know what's going on in your head. And so he would challenge you. You wouldn't stay long employed if you could not come up to that snuff because he allowed you to freely state your opinion and what you were thinking because he uh, respected every per person's thought and freedom of speech. And yet uh, his pedigree when it comes to blue blood is 10 times better than the king or queen that are sitting on the British throne, right? So um, I, I don't even know where to start, but I would like to say the years that I worked for them were more than just interesting in who I met, what I experienced. Uh, he had seven children, only four uh, lived to be adults, and his youngest, uh, Mary Soames, is still alive. And we correspond with each other uh, still today. Uh, but most of all, I learned it does not matter who you are by name. It, is, it matters who you are inside of yourself, what you have in dignity and honesty and kindness towards someone. Um, it was a very humbling experience for me, for instance, that everything in both homes were totally open. There was not a door closed or a drawer closed to me or locked. Uh, I was so impressed uh, because uh, there was a huge room in London as well as in Kent uh, that was uh, reserved for the gifts that they received from all over the world, from royalties, from uh, industrialists, from scientists, uh, uh, sports uh, uh, pianists, people in sport, and they were incredible, beautiful gifts. And every so often, I had to take them all out of the room and replace them with some new ones, so they, they had a rotation going. Um, one, uh, one thing when I said by outdoing the United States and France, in the gift that they wanted to give him after the Second World War was over, was, okay, you Americans uh, gave him in his uh, country residence, a, they built a movie house for him with an 18-foot cinema screen movie house. And of course, when we would be there over the weekend, he watched, he watched movies every night and we got to see all the newest movies that will then go to the West End uh, cinemas in London. We saw them first because they, they gave him the privilege of seeing them. Uh, and so, and then the French said, oh, what can we do, what can we, how can we outdo this? I don't know where they found it. They found the cellar 
of La Napoleon I, brandy from 1790s to 1830. And they were still in bottles. And uh, because uh, uh, to cool them, they would put soil on top of it and then a layer of bottles and then soil between it. So they wanted to donate that entire cellar to Sir Winston. But how do they go about it? Guess what? They called you Americans. They, you have the know-how, the big machineries. Oh, yes. So uh, uh, first uh, they had to excavate a part of his estate. They had to go and measure how big will this be. And then you Americans came with the big bulldozers and the big machines, the earth moving ones, and they put it in huge crates. They transported it onto the train to Calais, across the canal, and on to, uh, to his estate. And then, of course, in that room that they have extra uh, excavated for it. And I have to just give you one example. There were the, the bottles of brandy uh, f uh, from the time of Napoleon I, 1790s to 1830s, about. So, Sir Winston defended every drop of that brandy that he had after dinner when the gentlemen smoked and did all kinds of talk, political and otherwise. And then I would have to, to uh, give him the cigar and bring him the brandy. And if, when the bottle was about that deep down to be emptied, uh, I was taught by, by one of his secretaries how to excavate the next bottle of brandy. So I was taken to that cellar and there were two small shovels, and that uh, uh, secretary started to dig into the soil till they, he felt something hard. Then you put the shovel aside and start with your hand, excavating a bottle. That was easy. Now comes the hard part. You take that bottle, it is in the horizontal position, and now you have to slowly get it into the vertical with slow motion. Now, from there, you had to go three flights of steps, walking in slow motions up to the third floor. Why they did not want the settlement to be so disturbed that it would take weeks for it to settle and be drinkable. Uh, when we are that lucky to have that good of a brandy. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't want to overstep my time. There is so much more. I'm just scratching the surface uh, with um, telling you my experiences. Most of the time, every Tuesday, we would go to uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, for lunch uh, on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, sometimes Lord Beaverbrook, who owns all the newspapers uh, in London, would come. Princess Margaret came when she was just freshly married with uh, her uh, Snowden, the photographer, I think it was. Um, I was so surprised how short uh, Princess Margaret was. I didn't know. You don't know the real height, I think, until you see someone uh, in person. Uh, Onassis came, that scoundrel, forgive me, my. Uh, uh, when I went back to Switzerland, because we wanted, uh, I had an appendix that burst. And uh, they had to drive me. Uh, they, what, we were in Kent and his uh, country estate again, and they had to drive me very fast. Uh, and I was operated on, 
and I was there for two and a half weeks. He, they went then back to London, and he fell as he was going to say good night to Lady Clementine because they had uh, most people of that rank have separate uh, uh, bedrooms. He fell and hurt his neck. So here he was in London in the hospital. I was somewhere in Kent in the hospital with an appendix. And the nice thing was he sent me two dozen fresh eggs that he initialed. Guess what? I didn't get one egg. Every head nurse doctor wanted one. And of course, I couldn't say no. So they, they, I'm sure they never used it up because he did it by hand. Yeah. So anyway, as I say, I am just uh, scratching the surface. Uh, it was a very, very uh, challenging, hard uh, job. Uh, Lady Churchill was a perfectionist to the point where she alienated her own family. Uh, the good part was after uh, I left their service, um, she wrote me and her secretary several times to come back. That Sir Winston in his age does not uh, easily take to a new employee because I was the only one from the 18 employees that saw him daily, or Lady Churchill. All the rest, they had to be invisible running the household. So, uh, and, and we be, actually, we became friends uh, after I have left her service. Her birthday was the 1st of uh, April. I, uh, once I sent her my own quince jelly that I made, uh, I uh, made portraits for him. Sir Winston's birthday is on the 9th, uh, 30th of November. So, and uh, in other words, we uh, had very cordial correspondence uh, till Lady Churchill died. Sir Winston uh, died uh, the 30th of January uh, 1965. Yeah. Now, if I can answer a few questions, I'd be more than happy. Yes, sir. Um, what years were they that you worked for, and how old? Were they? Fifty-nine to sixty-one. Fifty-nine to sixty-one. Yes, sir. How old were you? In my mid twenties, if that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, did you ever get to taste the brandy with the brandy? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't dare. I would have been beheaded, or or lost my my job like that. No. Impossible. Yes, Mr. Kelly. And what happened to the girl who was with you? Frida, she's in Switzerland. Did she, what happened to her? Did she work for the churches as well? Yeah, she was the chambermaid. She was the chambermaid, yes. Oh, the, yes, first, I come to you. Yes. Uh, I know that he was an artist. I yes, artist. yes. Did you ever receive any of his artwork? No, but I did receive one Christmas, a Christmas card that had one of his paintings, a photograph, you know, and of course signed. No, 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 of course not. Just an employee, no, 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 not important. Yes. Uh, was Sir Winston writing uh, the history of English? Yes. At the time you were there? Yes. Is that what he was doing? Yes, he had five secretaries and one head secretary. Yeah. What kind of uh, cigars did you smoke? Havan, from Havana, Cuba. Uh, he had a walk in humidor. He walked, he smoked continuously from the morning till night. And I let you into a secret. I have about five or six that he started and didn't finish. <laughs> I did take them. <laughs> Were you ever in Blenheim Palace? Yes, yeah. yes, of course. Can you describe the palace, please? Oh my God. It's so huge, it's the largest. Um, okay, uh, Lord Carnarvon's uh, palace right now is filmed, um, what is it called in Channel 20? Downton Abbey. That's Lord Carnarvon's uh, uh, castle. Uh, uh, Blenheim times two. Uh, 8,000 acres of land, ponds, little palaces. It is such a huge 
edifice. You get hungry just walking the corridors two or three times up and down. I think I would have chocolate bars in every, ba in every bucket of my... <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, again, um, England did not believe in the Industrial Revolution of, like, John Deere tractors, the, the, the machineries for agriculture, and they lost a lot of people who then went into the factories, and so those huge estates had nobody to take care of their big land holdings, and uh, of course they were extremely expensive to run and hold, and one of the Vanderbilt girls uh, married the first Duke of Marlborough, which is the cousin of Sir Winston, of course. Fabulous. I mean, unbelievable. Any more? Yes? Did you say that Prince Philip was Queen Elizabeth II? No, no. He, her husband, he, he is still alive. They both are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, oh my god, what a scandal that would be. <laughs> Any more again? Yes, sir. Going going back further when you were when you were in Switzerland and you were a child. Yeah. And you said about paratroopers yeah. landing. Mm -hmm. Now were these people that were like in an invasion force and just got off, off Correct. Off, uh, Correct, yes. Or a plane they tried to escape from Germany. And uh, the, uh, the plane had difficulty, and they had to get out, so that they would parachute out of it, because the the Germans would shoot on planes that tried to leave. Now, you said that the Swiss were taking taking in these people, mm -hmm. and were they taking in people no matter which country they came? Oh yes, oh absolutely, yeah, absolutely, no difference. So you may have Germans and Czechs and Americans? Ab absolutely, yeah. Made, nationality made no difference. Yeah, yeah. Anyone? Yeah. No, no, I left in uh, 61. He passed away in 65. Uh, that's a very good question because nobody wanted to employ me. They were so intimidated. Yeah. Very hard. Yes, it was very hard. That's a very good question. Yeah. They were so. It apparently was so intimidating. What can we offer you now? I said a job. I need a job. Well, I went back to school, of course. <laughs> yeah. Again, anybody else? Yes. I think I remember reading that uh, Churchill was what is now called bipolar, a high, extreme high, extreme low. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably. That's he called it the black dog. He called it the black dog. Yeah. Uh, he also had a stutter. I don't know if you saw the 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 film The King's Speech, and in that film they briefly showed Sir Winston with the king as they walked from one room to the other. And Sir Winston said to the king, you know, I myself had a speech impairment. And the king did not know that. Of course, uh, Sir Winston became one of the premier orators in the English language. He conquered that impairment. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for coming today and sharing your stories with us. Oh, yes, thank you for having me. Yeah. The gifts that you talk about, the, the dignitaries, the royalty, the stole upon uh, yes. Churchill, what yes. became of the gifts? Did you distribute them out? Did, were you allowed to keep any for yourself? No, 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 of course not. A lot of them ended up in museums and, of course, the families. He had, um, as I say, four, uh, four of his children. Let me see how many grandchildren. Three, five, eight. I think he had 11 grandchildren, and they are, of course, carry on the family tradition and their name. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, sir? Did uh, Winston, when you were there, did Winston Churchill have his favorite thought there with him? Yes, Rufus. <laughs> yes. You know, he's always been associated with Bulldog. 
Uh, it was a pool, yes, 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 of course. And he had a, a marmalade, his cat, just a red and white tabby cat. Oh, yeah. He loved animals. But I have also another thing. I have read that Winston Churchill was born two months premature in the latest bathroom of Vladimir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Where then, if rumors uh, can be believed, uh, 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 Randolph, Randolph Churchill, his father, contracted syphilis from one of the maids in Plenheim and died when he was 43 years old. And I think that uh, uh, Sir Winston, his son then was called a, son, uh, a, a young man in a hurry because his father died so young. He thought he had, uh, he had to do lots of fast living to get everything in in case he's uh, going to die young and he died when he was 90. He drank everybody under the table and ate everybody under the table. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So, did you ever observe any effects from the strokes that he had? No. Uh, let me say this. Uh, we had both, we had to sign extensive papers that certain things we can never talk about. It. So even if I had said, uh, thought, I can never talk about it. Which I think is only right. The respect for privacy is fleeting and is going away so fast. It's it's frightening. Uh, really, truly, no, no. Even if we would not had to uh, sign all these papers, I would never do it out of dignity and respect. No. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very small token from Medina Library uh -huh. to thank you for this evening. Thank you very much. I have some Churchill books up here where we see the man in history, and I'm so grateful to you for taking us behind and showing us a little bit, the, a little behind, bit of the the scene. behind the scene <laughs> and the importance of that uh, man to this world and uh, yeah. to Europe today. Uh, yeah. And the free world. To the free world. Yes, thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>